Now I want to talk about something that I rarely talk about, but um, I, if I was to give this a title, it would be How to Vote Like Jesus. <laughs> you know, would Jesus vote? Let's find out. Okay, so we have our identity in Christ, and when, because of who you are, that, do you understand where the Spirit of the Lord is, there's liberty. So if you're the temple of the Holy Spirit, you have liberty inside you. Paul wrote to the uh, Galatians, for freedom Christ has set us free. And then he exhorts us, stand firm in the freedom. It means freedom in every sphere of life, not just our personal life, but every aspect of our life, relationally, toward creation, all of that. And so our resp there's a response and a responsibility. Freedom is amazing. It means we're no longer slaves. Our shackles and our chains have been broken. The scars, the lies, the curses have been broken, and the blessings are released. Oh my God. in every area of life. And so we want to stand firm in that, and we don't want to submit to being tangled, burdened, tied up again in the yoke of slavery. So then this, so we get into this issue when we talk about liberty and slavery, we might get into the issue of governments. And so we wonder, what about political engagement? Like, that doesn't seem very... Uh, spiritual, you know, because I'm, you know, I'm filled with love. The message is love. We want, we love our neighbor as ourself. We we love our enemies and and seek to make them friends, but we love them non-transactionally. We love them unconditionally, like God loves us. And so, what about pol politics? What about I mean, and so some think churches should not be engaged. Not this church. I know you're already engaged. But it's, there's clear pr biblical precedent. Moses, uh, Nathan spoke to David, Nehemiah, Esther, Mordecai, John the baptizer. He was involved in politics. It, you know, he went to heaven early for that. Uh, Jesus stood before Pilate and talked to him about reality. And, uh, and then Paul also interacted with very, but so it's always been the case. And I know you know that I mean, by your name, King's Church. How about that? So why is this important? Because really, if the church won't disciple people in how to think, the world will. Duh. You know. So I love, you know, we talk about Matthew 28, 19 and 20. It's called the Great Commission by a lot of people. I love how Eugene Peterson paraphrases it in the message you know, you know it. He says, go, and as you're going, disciple, make disciples of all nations. You know, and there's many applications. I'm sure you've heard some of them if you've been here for a while. But here it is in the message. Go out and train everyone you meet, far and near. <laughs> I love this. In this way of life. Now, that takes it out of you know, make disciples sounds like it's some, well, I don't know what that means. How about go out and train everyone you meet? We know what that means. You know, if you, if you own a business, you train your employees. If you have a job, by the example and by your conversation, you train your coworkers. You know, you're, you're training, just like parents train the children. How many parents have a, a child training class with their children that's formal? Not, I don't, I've never met any. You know, mostly your children are trained by the standards you set, the way you speak, the expectations you have. They watch you make decisions, and values and ethics are formed in them by modeling. Every one of you, no matter what you are, if you, I mean, no matter what your role in life is, you're able to train, er, train everyone you meet. Not in a formal way, but just by your life, by your conduct, by what you say, how you engage. Everyone you meet far and near in this way of life. It's this new way of life that we're born again. We're not what we were. We're citizens of heaven as well as citizens of the United States. And marking them by baptism in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Then, I love this part, then instruct them in the practice of all I've commanded you. I'll be with you as you do this. I love it. How many know when you're, we're doing what he tells us to do, we, he's with us. Whether we feel it or not, he's with us day after day right up to the end of the age. So the, the issue is not, so the per, church isn't getting more political, 
the politics have moved into realms that are really theological. And so, you know, we're just saying, hey, get back in your lane. You know, governments are here to build roads, issue driver's license, provide police, you know, safety, protection, make sure that the children of the nation are educated, but not necessarily, you know, teach them math, reading, writing, arithmetic, that's all good. But when they move into theology and ontology, it's crazy. How about redefining marriage? Is that in the Constitution? That, I mean, that was a dark day in 2015. Uh, how about erasing gender? How about having a Supreme Court justice who can't define a woman even though she is a woman? How, how about reframing uh, abortion, the murder of unborn babies, as reproductive freedom? For who? You know, it's like for the devil? I don't, can't figure it out. How about using schools to indoctrinate? And, and so these are areas that are not given to government constitutionally. You know, but, and so it's, the deal is, and the church hasn't become more political, we're being awakened to the fact that, hey, the government has moved into the lane of, that was given by God to be the realm of the family and the church. And so, so, hallelujah. Anyway, we're just, you know, we got the Bible, we got the Holy Spirit, we're the ecclesia of God, and we're just saying, hey, get back in your lane, government. You know, this is why we want to do that. Okay, now, here's, so here's the question. Would Jesus vote? Well, to answer this question, that we'll do this quickly. I mean, there are, there are literally three institutions that God established that, that, def, that shape human life. The first is the family, Genesis chapter 2. It wasn't good for Adam to be alone. And so there was the beginning of the family. And then the church, Acts chapter 2, the Holy Spirit comes upon a mass of people and starts this new reality called the ecclesia of God, the church of God. And then there's the state, Romans 13. It says, you know, we're, we're to be subject to governing authorities, no authority from God except those, and those that, ha that exist have been instituted by God. So that causes confusion, like, well, if the government tells us to do it, do we have to do it? But if we read the rest of the chapter, that government is instituted for good and for protection. So when a government actually becomes an enemy of the commands of God, like telling churches they can't meet together, telling families they can't raise their children, et cetera, et cetera, now, now God's calling us to civil disobedience, which is modeled in the book of Acts and many other places in Scripture. So we need to know, and, and you know this here because I know Pastor David's like brilliant at all this stuff, the USA is not a democracy. It's a constitutional republic. So, because <laughs> democra pure democracy ends in mob rules. You know, pure democracy you can have in a club. You know, how many want to do this? How many want to do that? And if, if they're stupid, you can leave the club. But if, <laughs> you know, if we have stupid people that are voting, anyway. Uh, <laughs> and so ele in a constitutional democracy, uh, elected leaders represent the people. And if the elected leaders represent, who are the actual leaders of the nation? Hmm. Okay. I'm going to give you a hint. It's in the beginning of the, of the preamble, we the people. <laughs> okay. So, I mean, we the people actually are, are an authority in the Constitution above the elected representatives. So that's why we, you know, we'll call it a... Democracy, because within each district there is a democ, you know, there's a democracy that votes on a particular person, and so we, the people, whose rights have been divinely endowed, you know, that God gave us these unalienable rights. I know you know all that. So, but God create. I mean, this is why the United States is a type of a new Israel. It's not. It's not a new Israel, but it's like the city set on the hill. And the Puritan founders and the early founders of this nation, and many since then, have said we have this call to be an example to the world. And um, w this is the nation in which there has been historically the most tolerance of the Jewish people, you know, who are, you know, a, a, and that's a significant statement there that there's never been a systemic purge of the Jewish people in our nation. 
and although that spirit's definitely rising up here, and uh, if we get into mob rule, then we see the breakdown of order and law, chaos. What, whatever God creates, the enemy will try to capture. This is, this is the next point. It's true of families. He, he captured the family in Genesis 3 because Adam wasn't doing, you know, he wasn't being the, the protector of his wife. Uh, it's true in churches, Revelation chapter 2. There's two churches, Pergamum and Thyatira, where Jesus is rebuking them because they've allowed Jezebel and, the, and Balaam, the spirits that energize Jezebel and Balaam, to lead the church into sexual immorality and um, idolatry and all these things. And isn't it interesting that there are churches that are, have not maintained a standard and have invited immorality into their churches. And all churches welcome sinners, but we don't want them to stay sinners. We want them to be set free, which is what saved means, okay? And so, and it's, all, it's also true in nations. I love Proverbs 29, verse 2, New King James, when the righteous are in authority, the people rejoice. When the wicked man rules, the people groan. Been a whole lot of groaning over these past few years. And uh, now, so when Christians do not vote, okay, listen to this, it's an abdication of leadership because we the people have been given leadership. We the church have been given insight. We've been, you know, we're being guided into all truth by the Holy Spirit who's given to us. So when we, the Christians, it's not only an abdication of a leadership position in our constitutional republic, but it's a form of passive rebellion toward God. It's wrong for a husband not to lead his family. It's wrong for a pastor not to lead a church. It's wrong for you to refuse to vote <laughs> and not engage in your assignment. So with all that being said, now we're going to ask the question, would Jesus vote? What do you think? Okay, a few people. I know you're afraid to answer. Um, I, I, but I'll say, yes, I believe he would because he, would never, he never did abdicate his God-given responsibility. He set his face like flint to Jerusalem, even though he did. Did he like it? No, he prayed, God, Father, if there's any other way, could take this cup from me. But I'm committed not my will, but your will be done. Isn't it interesting? God gives humans free will so we can give our free will back to him. He gives us free will. So, I mean, God comes to us. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, like you could hear his voice but refuse to open the door, then you won't come in. So he's saying, at that point, even though it's not his will that any should perish, that all should be saved, he's saying, not my will, but your will. But at that point of, of sacrifice, he says to the Father, not my will, but your will be done. So he returns as, <laughs> and that's what we do. Okay, so, are you with me? Yes. Okay, so let's talk about voting, because sometimes we get confused and we think, I don't, like to, I don't want to vote because I don't like either one that's on the ballot. Okay, so first thing we need to know, a vote is not a valentine, okay? It's not based on who's cool, cute, handsome, or gives you funny, or gives you warm fuzzies. Do, do you know, but it's like we're not in middle school. You know, we're not like, oh, oh, you know, but sometimes people approach it that way, and they go, oh, I'm not voting for anybody because I don't like either one. And, but they're not talking about their policies because they haven't even dug that deep. They're just talking about personality. So it's not a Valentine. First Samuel 6, God said, I mean, First Samuel 16, verse 7, Samuel was there and he was looking at the sons of Jesse and he thought, well, that guy's handsome. It must be him. He's going to be the king. And God said, nope, 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 nope. And he says, don't look on the outward. Man looks on the outward. But it's not who's handsome, who's tall, who's cute, who's funny. It's whom I've chosen. I look on the heart. And so um, people look at outward appearances. God looks at the heart. And so when we vote, why it's not a Valentine, is personalities come and go. Policies last a long time. 
and have big consequences. So don't for, vote for the one you like the most. Vote for the policies, okay? So it's not a Valentine. A ballot box is not a mailbox to send a message. You know, well, you know, so some people, and I've talked to people who've, who've said, they said, I don't like either one. I'm sending a message. I'm not voting. Well, no one's listening to that message. <laughs> no one. You know, I mean, this reminds me, there was a man, you know, and he, I, I mean, he, got, he had gotten really obsessed with the idea of owning an exotic sports car. And a, a few years back, I mean, I'm, this, I have some first, I had a friend, he had a, a collection of exotic sports cars. He was a very successful businessman and he wasn't married, so he, he had like uh, several million dollars worth of cars in his garage. And so we would go out and drive his cars. You know, and he'd say, hey, you want to go have lunch and go for, I go, uh, duh, yeah, you know. So my favorite, he had a Lamborghini, really like a rock, like driving a rocket. But my favorite was he had this convertible Ferrari F430. I loved it so much. I said, hey, Ben, his name was Ben. I said, when you get ready to sell us, let me know. Give me first rights of refusal. Well, he sold it and didn't even bother to enter because he knew I couldn't afford the insurance on it probably. But anyway, the, uh, but, so this guy, you know, he's, so he, he's just obsessed with this idea and it's getting close to his birthday and his wife says, hey, what would you like for your birthday? And he goes, I would like something that goes from zero to 200 really fast. She's like, that's it? That's it, okay. So, you know, a week or two later, it's his birthday, she puts his box on the table and he's thinking, like, what's in it? You know, maybe it's the owner's manual or something. He opens it up. It's a bathroom scale. But <laughs> <laughs> he thought he was sending a message, but she didn't hear it, you know. So anyway. So, um, and this is why usually, like, write-ins don't work. Like, you can write David. You could, don't, put, don't write in Jesus for president, you know, just so... Um, because no one's reading that, don't waste your chance to make a difference trying to make a point. So, and then the third one, so it's not a Valentine, it's not a mailbox, the ballot box isn't a mailbox, and this is the last one that a lot of Christians struggle with, like how could I vote for someone who's had a life like that? Well, a vote is a selection, it's not a sacrament, you know. It's not communion, it's not baptism, Jesus isn't on the ballot, and uh, I don't think there's ever been, every candidate is flawed, but, but a vote is a chance to make, you're making a selection, you're choosing the best path forward that is available. And if it's not on the ballot, it's not available. So you, we have to think about not how I feel, but what, what future this vote unleashes, okay? And so, um, but it's hard because we don't have the kind of leader we want. Actually, so I have three kinds of leaders here. The first one was Josiah. Thank you very much for giving us a little lesson on Josiah. He was a righteous king who did righteous things. Can you imagine he gets the whole nation in front of him and he reads the Torah or at least probably the scroll of Deuteronomy line by line, <laughs> And, and that's amazing. Then contrasted to Josiah, who brought reformation, was Ahab and Jezebel, who were very evil. And so they were evil persons who led Israel into evil practices, idolatry, child sacrifice. They persecuted the, the Bible teachers, the prophets. They closed the churches. <laughs> they murdered innocents, and they stole property from people. And Ahab was passive, Jezebel was aggress aggressive, and, pr and promiscuous. So when you have that kind of leader, these are like evil people who lead the nation or into evil practices. What, what do you have? You have cities filled with lawlessness, theft, uh, crime not being prosecuted. You have chaos in the cities. You might have a month or months on the calendar to celebrate perversion. Uh, you might have the children being taught perversion in sex ed classes at a very early age. You might have nine-month babies being killed. Uh, you might have parents having their children taken away from them if they don't endorse warped, idolatrous thinking. 
And uh, you might have the, the ones who are holding tr to truth are stigmatized and marginalized. That's what happened under Ahab and Jezebel. It's hell on earth. We pray for heaven on earth. That brings hell on earth. And so, and then we have this third kind that's very, it's hard to wrap our heads around, Jehu. So Jehu came, Jehu was anointed by, not even directly by Elisha, but by, by a young man that Elisha sent to prophesy and pour oil over Jehu, and then he fled, turned and fled because Jehu was kind of a wild guy. He was not very righteous, but he was anointed by God, and he drove his, he was, <laughs> he was so fierce, he drove his chariot like, you know, crazy. They could recognize nobody drives like that except Jehu, and he carried out his mandate with swiftness and ferocity. He threw Jezebel down out of the window, and that was the end of the house of Ahab. But so for us, if we have Josiah. That would be easy to vote for Josiah. We have Ahab and Jezebel. Don't want that. And then we have Jehu, and we're like, what do we do with this? And uh, I, I would just say we can't treat a Jehu like a Josiah. You know, we have to recognize the nature of what we're dealing with. A, 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 Josiah was a flawed leader who did good things, and that's better than suffering under Ahab and Jezebel, who are, and so the, when we're voting, you know, we're choosing, okay, what's the best path forward? And sometimes we have to overcome bias, spiritual issues, um, to be the salt of the earth. Like, and this is a salt of the earth issue, not, not you know, it's not... It's like, how do we preserve from societal rot? How do we do? And sometimes we have biases that keep us from that. I mean, this goes back to 19, okay, 1976. I, I've been a Christian for a few years. I, I was having an, I went to a, a Bible college. I'm doing internship in this church. And one of my jobs was teaching these little old ladies. This was real you know, initially really suffering for me. And I thought, well, I'll just teach them like they're a bunch of on fire young zealots. And, and they loved it. And, and uh, so I would teach them. And, but I had, some of them didn't drive, so I had to drive them home in the church van. And it, the church van said, God bless America on it. It was painted red, white, and blue. And it was like a form of death to me. Because, like, I just thought, and I had to drive into the barrio, you know, and I, I told the pastor, I said, you know, there are people in that barrio who when they see a band that says, God bless America, they want to shoot at it, you know? So, like, you understand. He goes, yeah, I think it's stupid. It was somebody else's idea. So, the, it, it, which was true. Anyway, the, not, not God bless America, but just this whole presentation. And so these ladies, they're really excited. It's the spring of 1976, and they're talking about the Republican convention. And I'm like, Republican? You know, like, uh, and so, because I didn't grow up in that, you know, the, the, and then they say, did you hear, there's a chance that Governor Reagan might get the nomination, which he didn't, you know, he didn't, he, he did in 1980. And actually, by that time, uh, I voted for him. He was the first Republican I ever voted for. But I had to get delivered because when I heard the name Ronald Reagan, I, I, like, I, I was a peace and love, flower child hippie, and, uh, and then I got saved, and Jesus is peace and love and beauty and everything great. But suddenly there's this rage inside me, like, Ronald Reagan, you know, like, and, and, I, and I recognize this is not the Holy Spirit, and you know. So after I dropped the, you know, I didn't manifest. You know, I didn't, didn't trigger outwardly. But after I dropped him off, I, I said, God, what was that? Where did that come from? And he, and he brought to my mind, I'm 17 or 18 years old. I'm standing in Sproul Plaza. Eldridge Cleaver, who was a, a Black Panther, if you don't know who he was, he wrote a book called Soul on Ice. He was a rapist, and he, he celebrated raping white girls. He said this, and then he got saved, radically saved. And then he sort of became, I don't know, a syncretist. <laughs> he didn't know what he was, you know. I don't know if anybody discipled him. But, but so at this, when I said, 
where did this come from? God brought me back to standing in Sproul Plaza. And as at the background, I wasn't even thinking I was agreeing with it. But he was leading 3,000 students to chant F. Ronald Reagan. F. Ronald Reagan over and over again. And it was like <laughs> ringing off Sproul Hall. And, 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 I, and actually, in my mind, I thought, that's bad karma, you know, because that was my paradigm then. Like, you shouldn't be cursing somebody. But that, even though I wasn't in agreement, that spirit got into me. And I'm just saying, why do people have Trump derangement syndrome? I, it's a spirit. It's a spirit. Why was it so hard for me? I, I can't tell you my fear and trepidation in 1980 voting for a Republican the first time because my parents were like hardcore Democrats. That's all. You know, I, I campaigned <laughs> in, in, when I was 17 for, you know, pre, the Democratic primaries and all that stuff. And our county, the person won. Okay. So, <laughs> but so... Anyway, it's very important to get set free from bias. Like, well, my family, my family, my family. And it's just like, God, fill me with your spirit. Help me to. So how do we decide? So this is what I want to say. And I'll do it. I think there's many policies that are important. Study the policies. I would tell you register to vote if you're not registered. But I noticed that yesterday was the last day you could register in New York. So border security. Okay, very important. Whose policies are most likely to slow the societal rot? Okay, um, border security. Well, I mean, obviously, we love immigrants. You know, we're called to love immigrants. We're all pilgrims. So it's not about the people, but it's about the government that's responsible to enforce the law. And God established nations and borders, Acts 17, 26. He marked out their appointed times in history and the boundaries of their land, NIV. Okay, um, we, and so we love immigrants. We, I mean, immigrants are always a gift to the nation. And, but there has to be order. I mean, it's like, so the Department of Homeland Security, you've probably heard this, but they, you know, in the last month or so, they they released that their estimate is between 10 and 20 million. How many know that's like a really broad estimate? Like, well, we're not sure. We're, we could be off by as much as 10 million. You know, like, what? It, but this is what they did know. Of those they vetted, 425,000 had criminal records. 16,000 had been convicted as rapists. 13,000 had been convicted of murders. And they were allowed to stay in the nation. They were vetted and allowed to stay, given a date to come back for a hearing, which no one can find them. You know, this is how. It, so that's scary. So here's the question when you vote. Which candidates more likely to restore our borders? Second major policy, religious liberty. Um, of course, Jesus is Lord. The first, the early church, when they cried out, Jesus is Lord, that was a revolutionary act because every Roman citizen was required to once a year, you know, declare that Caesar was Lord. So when the Christians said, no, there's a, a king above every king, you know, that was radical. And, but I, Religious liberty is given to us in the First Amendment. You know that. Freedom of speech, freedom of assembly, no violation of conscience. What does that mean? It means doctors and nurses should not be required to do things that are against their conscience. They should be able to diagnose and treat disease, which is what they, Bakers shouldn't have to bake a cake for something that violates their conscience. Ask Zach Phillips, who's still being persecuted by the state of Colorado. Graphic designers, likewise, they sh should be able to say, I'll do that website, but I won't do that website. School teachers like Byron Cross in Loudoun County, Virginia, should not lose their job because they refuse to call a student by a fake pronoun that these did not exist 10 years ago. Like, they didn't exist. And suddenly, it's like, this is the new reality. And, and so, it, by the way, the court gave, you know, mandated that he got his job back. Football coaches like Coach Joseph Kennedy, who would kneel on the, the football field in Bremerton, Washington, and pray, should not lose their job over that. And that all went all the way to the Supreme Court. He got his job back. I don't think, you know, it wasn't... They're, they still don't like him there. But see, it's not the place of government to restrict the free exercise of religion or freedom of speech. So, and nuns shouldn't have to pay a board, you know, 
for insurance that includes abortion, you know. But all these things. So which candidate is most likely to protect religious liberty? I said, I'm going to select that candidate. Oh, third issue, major issue of reality, biological sex. God created man, male, and female. And, and the reality is God loves every transgender person, you know. I mean, the, the and uh, I love it when detransitioners testify. And this freaks out the whole uh, agenda there. And uh, But what each transgender... It, and I, I knew somebody before all this was an issue who thought he was a woman, went through all the stuff, and then got delivered and actually married a woman, you know, and lives, and he's, he, they're living happily. But to anyone who's been through that, I just want to say that your, your scars don't define you, you know, but the scars, uh, Jesus' scars define you. So no matter what you've been through or how you might feel like I'm, I'm mutilated, I'm warped, but God can give you a meaningful, powerful life and he loves you and, it's, and he wants to bring you into his family. But, but to enforce this is to call God a liar, to rebel against the created order, to erode the family and to contribute to mental illness, to deprive people of the only truth that can set them free. And so you have to say, which candidate is likely to protect this? 14 states have shield laws, with transgender shield laws. Governor Tim Walz signed one into law in, in 2023, which say that, that if parents are not supportive of a confused child who thinks they're in the wrong body, that the state can declare a temporary emergency, take the child out of their custody, and allow mutilation to happen. 14 states, and um, it's just, you have to know, evil will never stop itself. It has to be dethroned, and that's our job. So which candidate will protect the <laughs> traditional family? You know, Jesus. Okay, real quick. Um, family. So we've got border, we've got religious liberty, we've got the issue of biological sex, which is actually, that's, a poly, that's an issue we're voting for here. Family. Uh, there's four, God's given these arenas of authority to um, individual, family, church, nations, and the health of each institution depends on the health of its components. When a government attacks the family, it's actually, it's like cutting off the branch that's supporting it, you know, because healthy families bring healthy churches, healthy churches bring healthy governments. This is how it works. And uh, healthy individuals make healthy families. So, so but gov how does the government attack family? How about easy and even incentivized divorce laws and tax codes? How about redefining marriage? How about erasing gender? That's an attack on the family and more. And so in, when the government takes away the family, what the government is actually trying, to, the government wants, is seeking to become and replace the family. And if any of you, I mean, or your parents or your grandparents were ever, ever lived in the Soviet Union, Eastern Europe, after, after World War II, they saw that, that the government stepped in and the parents, actually, the parents would be afraid to speak to their children because if their children repeated in the school what their parents said at home, the parents would be arrested and imprisoned and the children would become the wards of the state. We're not too far away from that. I'm not trying to sound alarmist, but the, but the government will take all the roles of the family, which is to protect, provide, educate, and indoctrinate Families need to indoctrinate, teach your children, <laughs> uh, Deuteronomy chapter 6. So which candidate will support that? And then the last one is very important is life. And I just say this, if you're one of the 25% of women in America who suffered an abortion, no, you know this, I'm sure you've heard it, the Lord loves you and he forgives you and you're not defined by the death of your child, you are defined by the death of God's only son, Jesus Christ, who was given so that our sins could be totally washed away. And so which candidate will protect the unborn? Well, sadly, neither candidate is consistently pro-life, but thank God for Trump because 
of him we have the you know the the decision that overturned Roe v. Wade as a national standard, and so now it's to the states. But the Democratic Party moved from the words of Bill Clinton that he wanted abortion to be rare, safe, and what, I forget the other word, but to this place where they where there's no limits. Um, Twelve states have abortion up to nine months. I believe New York's one of those. And uh, and you know, at nine months, a child thinks, feels, and is emotionally connected to the mother. And actually, before that. But this is so we cannot support that position. And I'll just say this: Kamala Harris refuses to articulate even one restriction on abortion. She's act, and she stated this that she wants to eliminate the filibuster, which has been a safeguard in the Senate for 180 years. She wants to eliminate it for the sole purpose of overturning Roe v. Wade and passing a national abortion mandate. So, uh, anyway, Proverbs 8.36, all who hate me love death. Jesus. Which candidate will best limit the taken and unborn lives? Okay, you need to stand up because I, I'm getting long here. Um, I just want to talk about the tragedy of non-voting persons. And I agree, no policy or politician can save a person. But good leaders can bring restoration to a nation. See, so sometimes we say, well, you know, no politician's going to save America. It's true no politician will save Americans from hell. Only Jesus and his shed blood can do that. But a righteous leader can save a nation from destruction. And so righteous leaders save us from hell on earth. Decisions have consequences. Hell is darkness, chaos, lawlessness, and rebellion. And we know what hell in a city looks like. <laughs> so, so this is a call to action. 20, 20, 30 million Bible-believing Christians abdicated their spiritual responsibility and didn't vote. Can you imagine 30 million? And you know how it feels? Is It's just, uh, I don't like either one. I'm just going to watch. There's a good game on. <laughs> I don't know if there's games on, on Tuesday, Tuesdays. But, you know, pe you just get this lethargy. That's that lethargy is not the empowerment of the Holy Spirit. It's not the peace of God. It is a spiritual warfare against you taking responsibility and selecting not the perfect candidate, but the best path forward to a better future. And so I just, I mean, the 2020 election was determined by 42,000 strategically placed voters. Is that wild? When you might think, well, we're in New York, it's a deep blue state, or we're in New Jersey, it's deep blue. But I want to tell you, the, the total votes make a difference. When they stack it up and they say, well, you know, he won, he, he didn't get a popular majority. But that's because a lot of the people didn't vote. <laughs> And, and so I'm just saying, let's do our job, let's go, let's do it, and let's pray and vote, and America will be saved. I think I'm done. So God bless you.